Let me, uh, let me start off with uh, apologizing for my overly complex, non-specific title. I, I sort of wanted macular pigment, whatever. But uh, that seemed less professional, so I would leave room to talk about whatever I wanted to talk about. And I, I also have a sort of a Benjamin Button sort of organization here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the, the older and elderly adults and, and move to, the, to, to some observations about infants. So, uh, so just to start off with, and you know, to remind everyone, we have all these, these concentrations of lutein and zeaxanthin in the eye. And, and uh, to, to address John's question, you know, amount we, we, can, we can say things about, about amount in the eye because a lot of the functions are optical and, and, and very linear. And, and, uh, but in the brain, that's, that's a different situation. Uh, you know, I, uh, a few years ago, I actually smoked a, a leafy green vegetable. And I didn't smoke very much of it, but it had a fairly profound effect on my brain function. <laughs> and so uh, brains are a very different kind of thing. They, uh, they, the amounts mean different things there, so, so, uh, so we don't really know, but, but, it, but it's, it's not the same interpretation often. Um, however, we do know that it's in the brain, and it's in, in some very pivotal sections of the brain. So one example is that it's found in the, in the cerebellum, and, and that is a very modular area of the brain that's known to be related to uh, muscular coordination and equilibrium. And, and so uh, those, are, those are easy functions to test. One, one, one very common test is the standing leg test. So what you have patients do is they, they stand on one leg and close their eyes. And you should try to do this, by the way. And, and you should be able to do it for at least a minute. But, um, but then you, you, you measure how long it takes for them to, to, to fall. <laughs> and, uh, and when you do that, and when you measure macular pigment in the, in the retina, individuals with higher levels of of macular pigment in the retina have improved balance. So that, that we believe that's probably mediated by uh, lutein and zeaxanthin in the, in the cerebellum. Remember that the vision and, and, and motor function are very interrelated. You, you probably have the, had this experience where you've been sitting and a train moves uh, next to you. That's called the autokinetic effect. And you actually literally feel like you're moving forward. There's a vestibular ocular reflex that corrects my eye movements for the movement of my body. So, so movement is very, and vision, obviously, are very interrelated. And, and lutein and zeaxanthin likely have a role there. Um, here's just another example. We've been talking about neural processing speed. Um, lutein and zeaxanthin are also in the visual cortex. And we know that a lot of temporal processing speed is more of a brain phenomena than, a, than, a, than an eye phenomena per se. So for example, when you're looking at, the, at your monitors, your, your retina can actually follow that. So if you do a, you measure electroretinogram of, of an individual watching a monitor, you, you can actually, uh, the retina can follow the flicker, but it looks completely fused to, to the individual. And, and what causes that fusion is the actual visual cortex itself. So you can measure EEG and, and, and uh, critical flicker fusion thresholds, for example, are very correlated with the alpha and beta component of the EEG. So we know that the, 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 the retina can follow things much faster than the brain can follow things. And that kind of makes sense, because a lot of visual behavior has to be extraordinarily fast. I mean, there's a reason that the optic nerve is so myelinated. Vision has to be faster than you can consciously process. You know, if a, a ball is flying at my head, I need to not think about it. I need to just move. So vision has to be fast. I, I gave a, a sports talk a couple of days ago, and I used the example of, of, of baseball. So when a, when a pitcher throws a ball 90 miles an hour at the, at the batter plate, which is only about 60 feet away, it gets there in about 400 milliseconds. But it takes 500 milliseconds to consciously perceive a visual image. So they actually have to see the ball and hit the ball before they actually perceive the ball. So that's, that's just vision has to be extraordinarily fast. So there's some indication that, that, that lutein speeds up that process. So we have data from a number of studies just where we measure the amount of lutein and zeaxanthin in the retina and, and the, 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 all the macular carotenoids and then relate them to processing speed and higher levels are, are related to, to faster processing. Um, here's just another example of that data. And Emily Bovier has our newest data on this point in, in her poster. But we measured uh, fixed and variable reaction time and 
coincidence anticipation. And how you do that is you have a wall with a long bank of lights that travel down at different speeds. And then you have individuals, and we're studying baseball players at the current time, uh, press a button right when that, that, that light gets to the target location. That's called coincidence anticipation. And, uh, and then you, you vary the, the, the rate at which that light flies down that, that linear line. And, and what we find is that individuals with higher lutein have better coincidence anticipation. And, um, and if you supplement them with, in this case, this was a, a very large dose of zeaxanthin, they can ha they'll have improvements in these variables. So, so there seems to be a relation to, to neural processing speed. We, uh, we're now doing some investigations on how to measure that in infants. And, and we're, we're, we're not at the process where we can say anything about what, how lutein affects that. But, but it's interesting to note that you can look at babies. This is babies from 3 to 12 months. And you can measure neural processing speed in babies. And already, there's fairly large differences. Babies will differ by a factor of, of 2 when they're 4 months old. And, uh, and so there, you, you see these brain differences right off the bat. So, so the question is, can they be? Can they be modified? Now, the other obvious big effect of neural processing speed is at the end of life. You know, the, the, if there is one factor that characterizes cognitive decline, it's, it's slowing of neural processing speed. In fact, sometimes that's seen as the, the basic neurological trait that predicts all the other declines in verbal fluency and memory and all these other things, et cetera. And, and one reason for that neurologically, of course, is you just have cell loss. So, so the nervous system always is dealing with, with cell loss. That's one reason why, by the way, a lot of absolute measures of function aren't particularly good diagnostics for loss, because the brain is very good at correcting for loss. That's what the brain wants to do, after all. It wants to keep you as functional, you know, basically long enough to have babies. Then you, know, then you can just sort of die and decline. But you know it, the, the idea. Is so so you take the example of the retina. You have about you know maybe 90 million rods when you're 20, but by the time you're 60, you have about 60 million. You've lost 30 million rods, but your rod-mediated sensitivity is almost the same, maybe one or two percent different on average. So so what's happening here is the brain is compensating for that loss. So uh, so when you measure function, you know, you're what you're really measuring is you're measuring real anatomical loss and the compensation for that loss. So, uh, so what you can't compensate, though, for very particularly easily is processing speed. So if you have a lot of loss of neurons in your brain, you have to recruit a lot more brain to solve similar problems. Hence, it slows your processing speed. Just, just work on an Excel file with an old person, and you'll know what I mean. So you just kind of move them away and do it yourself. But uh, so, so what, we, what, we, what we're doing, what we started some time ago, is looking at cognitive function in the elderly. And, and, and this was just, I, I'm showing this data simply because it's different from the other data that we've, we've seen so far. And this is on individuals with mild cognitive impairment. And we've measured their, uh, their macular pigment and then related it to these various measures of, of cognitive function. And, and like, the, like with the normal elderly, we see a, a significant relation to, to to, to all these uh, cognitive measures. Um, now, I'm not going to talk about all our, our visual function stuff, but I want to make I'm going to talk just about a couple of these. But I want to make a couple of points. Um, Stephen said how you know, the fact that lutein affects visual function is, a, is, is, an, is indeed a fact, that it's not a hypothesis. And, and, we and there's two good reasons that I agree for, with him. One is this fancy yellow banner here that actually says it. So you know it because there it is right by the lectern. The other is that you can go downstairs, of course, and measure your macro pigment using psychophysical techniques. So there, there's a wide variety of psychophysical techniques, you know, color matching, absolute thresholds, minimal border techniques, uh, you know, you name it. There's psychophysical method, methods of, of measuring it. So you go down on those devices and you see that visual stimulus. And you uh, and you and you you change a knob, you are now conducting a visual motor activity that should be linear rela linearly related to the amount of macular pigment that you have. So obviously, lutein and macular pigment affects visual function, or we wouldn't be able to do that. So so the real question 
is does it affect visual function in a way that's ecologically significant? So that's, so, so that's, that's one thing that we always have to do when we measure visual function. And, and the fact is, most of the clinical measures that we use are fairly awful measures of ecological visual function. Certainly, Snellen acuity is, is a particularly bad one, but you know, contrast sensitivity is not a particularly good one. After all, I mean, how often in life do you see non-moving uh, achromatic gratings? You know, the world is colored and things move and you're moving, and so it's uh, these things don't actually translate all that well to, to spatial vision in the in the, in the environment. Now, another point I want to make about visual function and, and brain function is, is these two things are related in ways that aren't, 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 aren't at first obvious. One way they're related is a lot of the diseases themselves are just comorbid. The, the, the retina is a little piece of brain tissue that's subject to oxidative stress and inflammatory stress, but so is the brain. So it's, it's not a surprising thing that, that uh, macular degeneration and dementia are, are highly comorbid. But what's less obvious, though, is that sensory decline actually promotes cognitive decline. So for example, in this, in this specific study, what they did is they looked at various stages of, of macular degeneration and then compared it to the uh, MMSE, Global Cognitive Scores, and individuals with more severe uh, macular degeneration also had more severe cognitive impairment. And in this phase of the study, what they did is they took people who, were, who had the same level of macular degeneration degener fundoscopically, so visible pathology, and then they, uh, but, but differed in visual function, and the, and the, and the subjects with the same uh, fundus pathology, but worse visual function, had far greater risk of, of, co of, of cognitive impairment. And, and so sensory decline can actually promote uh, cognitive decline. And, 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 and the best example I have of this is audition. So if you're, if you're starting to have some hearing loss, and I'm lecturing right now, then you know what, what will often happen, <coughs> excuse me, is that you'll miss every 10th word that I say, for example. And you really have to, to, to focus on what I'm saying in order to hear what I'm saying, which shifts your cognitive load. So, so automatically, you're getting way less out of my lecture than you would if you didn't have hearing loss. So that's a sort of cascading effect that just, it just promotes the, the, the eventual cognitive decline. So, so visual function is very important. Maintaining visual function is very important just for the health of the, of the brain itself. Now, here is a study that we published a few years ago looking at you know, an example of, of another example of, of brain function. And, and uh, this study, we looked at rod-based noise. One, one thing that the brain can't compensate for is actual noise. So if, if, I'm, if I'm ramping up my sensitivity so I don't have a lot of sensitivity loss, what, I, what you also do is you, you, you increase the gain of the system. And when you increase the gain of the system, that increases the noise in the system. So we found that, that lutein in this case, measured in the, in the retina, was, was linearly related to the amount of noise in the, in the rod system. Now this was not a filtering effect because we measured it peripherally and used long wave stimuli, but it was related to the noise. Better way to measure noise, though, is in the auditory system. And recall that lutein is also in the auditory cortex. And, and one reason that, that noise is, is good to measure in the auditory system is because unlike the, uh, the visual system, first of all, there's way fewer receptors. You know, there's 90 million or so photoreceptors, but there's only about 40,000 hair cells in your inner ear. Furthermore, most of the information coming from your cochlea to your brain is actually, uh, or most of the information from your cochlea to the brain is going to your cochlea, not to your brain. So uh, there's only this one row of hair cells in the, in the cochlea that are actually afferent, encoding a sound and sending it to the brain. The other three rows of hair cells are actually efferent. They receive information from the brain. And the reason that is, is they're, they're basically changing the mechanics of the basilar mem membrane in order to allow you to selectively hear. So, so one, way, one thing that we can do as humans, right, is that we can pick out meaningful sounds. So when, when you're in a uh, noisy restaurant, you can talk and, and pick out the, 
the sounds that are meaningful from all the other extraneous sounds. Like if when many of you went to the Eagle Tavern last night, the fact that you could have a, a conversation there is uh, computationally amazing. You know, and, and by the way, no computer can even come close to doing this. You cannot you know, program a computer that could selectively attend to your voice in that kind of situation. But of course, we do this effortlessly. Less effortlessly as you get older. So as you lose hair cells in your inner ear, you lose a lot of these, you know, just statistically, you're gonna lose a lot of these more, more of these outer hair cells, so noise impacts your hearing more. So you can hear me fine in this silent auditorium, but if people start speaking, you lose the signal, so you, you start losing, losing hearing. So what we did is measured, uh, this was uh, Jennifer Wong's dissertation, we started, we measured auditory thresholds, and then we measured auditory thresholds in the presence of, of noise, so white noise imposed on the signal. And we found that when we measured the, the peak of the audibility curve, and this was in uh, relatively young, healthy individuals, and then we measured that, that peak of the audibility curve in the presence of noise, that um, higher levels of, of, of macular pigment was related to a preservation of hearing under conditions of high noise. So that's, that's data that, that we're just, we just finished collecting. Um, now I said I was gonna talk about one effect, and, and uh, this is for more information about this, you can see Laura Fletcher's poster, but this idea that, that, uh, that macular pigment extends visual range. Certainly one, one clue that we, we can get that, that the pigments do this is just ecologically, animals often have intraocular yellow filters and, and animals that have to see at a distance particularly have intraocular yellow filters. So you can look at prairie dogs, for example, and they have a very yellow, uh, very intensely yellow filter, or, or some fish that have to see at a distance to see predators at a distance, or, or birds. Birds have to, uh, have to see little rodents on the ground. In fact, a, a hawk ate one of our rabbits and uh, almost caused the, the destruction of my romantic relationship because I put the ro rabbit you know, outside, not aware that the hawk would eat the rabbit. So, um, so the, uh, yeah, of course, birds have lutein in their, in their oil droplets which serve to filter the light before it's incident on the outer segment and has a very similar, similar effect. That's why quails are often used as a, as a model. So, Carotenoids are, are widely used in nature with animals that must, must see at a distance. I don't know why I keep trying to advance the slide with a computer. Confusion. Um, so, so, so why is that? And as, as Stephen indicated, you know, you have, we have blue scatter in the environment, and that can really impede our, our ability to see in the distance. So when you consider all things equal, you know, if you can... If you have blue haze in an image, it will, this is the same image with, with more blue haze. Even humidity can, can induce scatter. It really limits how far one can see. And, and remember that for most of our history, we weren't doing this. We weren't seeing things right here. We were seeing things in the distance. That's how, that's how vision had to be. I, I love to tell this story of my, my son's, you know, uh, really embracing this idea that reading was unnatural, you know, <laughs> because, uh, it is, really, according to our, the, the, the history of our species. We didn't spend hours looking at things like this all day. So uh, the, the idea that mo so many of us wear, wear glasses is, is a modern condition. I mean, this was not true for most of our history. It was very, it, it, it's not a naturally selective trait to be myopic, right? I mean, you couldn't have been out on the savanna going, you know, is that a lion out there somewhere? <laughs> Because then they eat you, and you don't evolve. And so uh, that was a rare thing, not a common thing. Like I said, what we try to do in the lab is, is, is do these visual measures in an ecologically significant way. And that, that requires some pretty advanced optics. So we use a, a xenon system that can, that can almost perfectly mimic the sun. We, uh, we, we buy some fairly advanced filters that, that can simulate haze. How we did this specific experiment is we use these contrast gratings here, um, use this channel of the optical system to simulate the haze that goes then over the target and between the eye, and um, then used uh, you know, grating targets. 
And, and in the first study, what we did, and we didn't want to take all this six months and years and two years to change people's macular pigment. We wanted to do things fast because we're American. And uh, so I, I, we created these uh, macular pigment filters. These are nice too, by the way, because if you have like a nice macular pigment filter, then you can kind of look through it and look outside and see how it sort of affects your vision and gives you ideas for things to do. And the first one I made was this one, where we had these optical flats, and you have this lutein and zeaxanthin solution in here. And if you vary the optical density, or the, excuse me, the path length, that will also vary the optical distance of macular pigment filter. You also use these little cavettes that you can just put in the system. Like, so these are little macular pigment filters filled with lutein and zeaxanthin solution. And um, when we did that, and when we measured those contrast thresholds, as we added filter, we got a very significant improvement, about you know around 30 percent, which was what our what our modeling had suggested. Um, we also, in a, in a subsequent study, this is the one that, that Laura Fletcher is showing in her poster, measured macular pigment in individuals, and then measured these these uh, thresholds under in, in with, with induced haze, and macular pigment was linearly related to the amount of haze that was uh, imposed. So there was this effect on visual range. Now, having said that, why improve your macular pigment? Why not just wear yellow glasses? In fact, they're all the rage and they make you look cool now. So uh, why not just wear spectacle uh, lenses? And I, as I noted the other day in my sports talk, this is widely done. People do wear yellow filters in order to, to improve their vision. But, and by the way, they're quite specific to the sport you know, that people do this. So, so the reason that, that, that this isn't a good idea <coughs> is, is several. One, whenever you're strategically filtering, of course, the, the, way, the, the filter only helps based on the illuminant. So, so illumination in a natural environment can really change. So this is haze here, sunlight. But of course, if you're in this kind of light, then shortwave filtering is not going to help you much because all the, all the light's over here. Or if the light's dimmer, you know, it can change. Also, the nature of the yellow filter itself is, is dramatically different. I, I uh, did a paper last year, I wrote a paper last year where I reviewed a, about 100 studies on yellow filters. And of course, just because it looks yellow doesn't mean its transmission characteristics are the same. It, they dramatically varied. So you have this, the, the illuminant, then you have the filtering. Then, of course, you have the lens and macular pigment. They're filtering in your eye. So, so imagine if you take an individual with a log unit of macular pigment, a really dense yellow lens, and then you also add a yellow filter. That's going to have a very different effect on your visual function than if you uh, take an individual with very low macular pigment. So all these are considerations in terms of how they're going to affect your, 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 your visual function. By the way, they aren't often considered when people do these filtering studies of of how visual function is affected. Um, so why isn't all these limitations true of macular pigment itself, if it's the case that it has to be so fit, the specific niche? You know, it was, then it would mean that in some situations, having macular pigment would be an advantage, and others it would be a disadvantage. The, the difference is that, because, is that the brain, again, is there, and dynamically can control for stable features. You know, what you see has very little to do with the, the, the optics of your eye. You know, the, 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 this, the light in this room is going on and off every, few, few, uh, every minute or so. You know, you're blinking. But you don't notice you're blinking because your brain corrects for the blink. You know, I could turn the light on and off in this room like you're blinking, and you would totally notice that. So the brain is very involved in, in visual perception and can do things like correct for filtering by macular pigment. So we, we did a number of stu a, stu a few studies years ago where we measured both color perception and just sensitivity to shortwave light in a bunch of individuals with dramatically varying amounts of macular pigment. And what you find is that if you measure shortwave sensitivity and isolate S cones, so you're really even just measuring S cones, and you measure here's an individual with almost no macular pigment, and here's an individual with very high amounts. So this individual here is blocking about 95% of the light right in the center. But what you find is their sensitivity is almost exactly the same. So despite the fact that 
90 something percent more light is getting back to the, that one person's photoreceptors, overall sensitivity is about the same. So the visual system can compensate for filtering so that it can have the visual function effects without changing. And, and how does it do that? It does that by increasing gain to the S-cone system. So again, experimentally, what you can do is you can isolate the S-cone system, measure its sensitivity, and then measure basically how it increases gain. So you can measure it outside the fovea, inside the fovea. And then what we've seen is it just sort of ramps up gain to offset the, the pigment density. We've measured this in several individuals, and, uh, and it fits those predictions quite well. And quite recently, one of my graduate students, Nicole Stringham and Jim Stringham, um, measured uh, uh, how this is done. And, and, and what we found is that, is that the, uh, the S-cone system varies its temporal summation properties in order to offset filtering by the pigment. So that's how it does. One way to, to change the gain of a system is to vary firing rates, and that's, that's, that's how it's done. Um, now I'm going to switch and talk to infants. And I'm almost, I see, have five minutes. So I'm going to talk about infants very quickly, just make a few real, real points about them. One, one point is simply that one reason why uh, lutein could have a disproportionately high effect in, in infancy is that things are simply changing so rapidly. So the eye grows about, by about 30% in the, in the first six months of life. And think about how significant that is. I mean, it doesn't change. You don't need much change in axial length to have a fairly dramatic effect on acuity. And, and an infant's eye is changing that much every day. Um, here's, the, here's, here's slices of visual cortex in a newborn and just six months later. And so you have this dramatic proliferation of cells. And remember that these cells don't come from air. They come from the diet of the infant. It's the composition of our diet that affects the, uh, the, the production of these cells. Lutein enters these tissues pretty much right around the point when, when nervous system starts to differentiate from other tissue. So this was a study that was done by a group out of Russia. And, and, and uh, this is the amount of lutein and zeaxanthin in the vitreous. And, and it's, it's first detectable about an eighth, tenth week of gestation, which is, by the way, right around the point where the, the ocular tissue is starting to be recognizably ocular tissue. And then it sort of accumulates in the vitreous and then starts migrating out to the lens and retina at, at, at that time. Um, I'm going to move ahead. Uh, well. Let me make this, this other point. Now, this, this, I thought this was a quite interesting study. This was a study that measured the carotenoids in serum and, um, and then the diet of, of these pregnant mothers. And what they found is that most of the carotenoids matched the diet of the mothers quite closely. But lutein did not. Lutein actually increased during, uh, during the three trimesters and then stayed a fairly significant proportion of cord blood. And, and the idea that was posited by the, these, these authors was that it was being drawn from the mother's stores. We've seen this in our lab. We've measured a few women that were, or one in particular, that was, that was pregnant and noticed that her macular pigment went down during, uh, during her pregnancy. Um, here's just another example. Lutein, one of the reasons that colostrum looks yellow, and uh, this is colostrum just to remind you that it's yellow. And, by the way, let me make a professional point here. You don't be at work and type in words like breast <laughs> in, in Google image. It's breast milk, but still, a lot of things kind of popped up that I didn't intend. <laughs> so this is a tasteful picture of colostrum. And you know it's very yellow. And it's not yellow because mothers instantly start eating a lot of you know, green leafy vegetables right after having babies. The idea, again, is it's, it's drawn from her stores and concentrated in breast milk reflecting some need of the, of the infant. Um, we showed this. Um, here's another point. I just have a few more, one minute or so to make a, a few points. Baby's retinas are, baby's lenses are extremely clear. Now remember that our, the, the crystalline proteins in the, in the anterior lens oxidize in adults, making the lens quite yellow and ironically protecting the, light, the, the retina from blue light uh, damage. But baby's retina, baby, baby's lenses are actually transparent. They look a little blue. And in fact, when they've measured them, they have this little transmission window, which, which I noticed, by the way, uh, lines up very nicely with that aggregates of, of lutein and zeaxanthin. So if there is aggregated lutein and zeaxanthin in the retina that shifts it to the ultraviolet side, 
it would line up with this, this transmission window quite well. But um, so that they're more damaged by, by light than, than adults are. Um, and of course, we know that, that shortwave light is disproportionately damaging. This, this was a study that, that Jack Warner did looking at that, uh, an ultraviolet uh, absorbing IOLs in one eye and clear IOLs that are put in the other eye. And he found that just the damage from the clear IOLs was so dramatically higher than the damage from the UV absorbing IOLs, especially to the, to the S cones. Um, since I, I, I'm almost out of time, let me just mention two more studies. This was a study that was done by Lou Rubin just a couple years ago, where he, uh, he took infants, and this was preterm infants, and one group he supplemented their formula with lutein and omega fatty acids, and the others that he, he did not. And what he found was the infants that were on the control formula compared to the supplement formula, had very significant declines in the, in the alpha wave of their ERG, which is the, the part of the ERG that, 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 that reflects initiation of, of, of rod signals. So that was a significant clinical effect. And uh, let, me, uh, let me end with this denouement. We've been, we've been talking a lot about supplementing and, and uh, you know, what to do when people have early signs of AMD, and, but, but recall, that degeneration starts really early. This is one example of, of, of the lipofusin buildup in early life compared to the rest of life. And you can see this really rapid buildup of, at this point, it's, it's, it's mostly oxidized lipid. It's not a lot of the more toxic components of lipofusin. But you know, it's a really vulnerable period. So degeneration, unfortunately, kind of starts in utero. So, so it's it, the, the what, what one, one, one one statement we want to make as a group is not to sort of sit on your couch and eat Doritos all your life, have a degenerated retina, and then take a supplement. I mean, this is a lifelong process that begins at birth. And, 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 and a better strategy is to promote you know, a healthy lifestyle starting with infants and, and going throughout life. I mean, this is the, we, we don't want to be like the, the, the rest of the disease groups and uh, just promote treatment. This is all doctors have become disease care managers and not health professionals at all. I think that that's uh, the message we want to we, we relay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We have time for that. Two questions. One of your slides you showed the maternal stores of lutein. Uh -huh. Did the maternal stores of lutein, did those go down per trimester, or it looked fairly constant. Well, that's, well what, what they did is the opposite. They actually went up. And they went up in a way that, that didn't reflect the diet of the mothers. So, uh, so the, 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 the interpretation by the authors of that study was that it was being drawn from the stores. They, they, did, they didn't measure fat or anything else in the mothers, but that was their, that was their conclusion. You mentioned a study. Um, where the macular pigment is related to the auditory, auditory um, perception. Mm -hmm. So is there lutein in the ear? Um, well, I, uh, it hasn't. One, one, thing, one reason that, you know, unlike the, the eye, that it wasn't until really about the 60s that people were really starting to get good information about the cochlea. I mean, it's, it's about the size of a pea, and it's deep in temporal bone. And so uh, it's, it's really very rarely analyzed. Uh, for, for almost anything. But, uh, so there's been no analysis of, I know of, of, of Could there be vascular a study tissues. So I, I don't know if it's in the ear. But it's, we know it's in the auditory cortex, which is the reason that we sort of looked at it. So are there studies that actually tested lutein supplementation would increase hearing or improve hearing? All this is very, very new. I mean, we haven't even, this is the first time anything about auditory stuff has been presented. So not, not yet. Mm -hmm.